recording so on monday i will give you two more office hours i'll send you the zoom link uh between today or, or tomorrow so we'll have three office hours on monday uh probably the other two will be in the uh, uh in the afternoon um so yes the exam is on monday at night uh hopefully everyone tried uh the respondus practice that one does not count towards your grade nor the practice exams but like the respondus practice was just for you to check uh that uh respondus is working uh, so it depends on what you mean by review. I mean, on Monday, we do have to cover new material. Today, we are going to finish the material for the exam. So everything I say will still help you for Monday's exam. Like um, office hours, I mean, I am happy to just solve any problems you have. I don't particularly, I don't want to choose like problems because not everyone can then show up and then like, you know, uh, it's better just to answer like the questions that people ha like are wondering about. So, so but yeah, like on the a month, like if you show up for the office hours on Monday, we can go over anything. Uh, uh, and it can it doesn't have to be specific. You could just say, oh, uh, uh, could we all go over again this specific topic? And then I'll try to come up with some example or something like that. But I still prefer for people to just show up with. Uh, something that they want to ask me about, even if it's um, to gen like it can be general, but it's better than um, me just deciding uh, what what to do during office hours. So, but again, it's a short exam. So for what it's worth, uh, it is worth eight percent of the class of the of the grade of the course grade. So it is. Um, not a tragedy if something goes wrong. Although I think if you have done, if you work out the practice exams and did the assignments on my lab, I think you'll be well prepared. So like, I don't think the, like the difficulty should be a surprise if you did all those uh, practice problems. So, but you know, I, like always people, like it's the first time people can get ner nervous and things like that. But even if that happens, I'm just saying, it is not worth, I mean, it is a, it is worth less than usual compared to previous semesters. So it's, um, so just keep that in mind. But yeah, so let's, let's, uh, yeah. Uh, let me, yeah, just finish the material for the exam today. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so today we'll just finish some stuff about 13, chapter 13, the stuff that we need for the exam. So um, just as a reminder of what we were doing last time, the idea is that if you have like curve, I mean, think of it like a, a, a road in space or some sort of roller coaster or whatever. So it is a curve. You can think of it as representing like the trajectory of a particle. So curve equals trajectory. And so if you have like something moving along this curve, like a uh, like a person or a car or whatever, like you can think of it of there being like as a pos like a position vector. But I mean, since a particle moves in time or it's moving along the road, this position vector will depend uh, on some variable which we usually call t, because we want to think of it as as time although that's not necessary, but it's like sort of useful. So that's just like the position at time t. And so the idea is that, that like what that ends up doing is specifying the x 
y and z coordinates as functions of time. So uh, usually the way in which you write this is like r of t equals x of t, y of t, c of t. Okay. So that just means that you think of x, like, you know, x, y, and z as depending on time because uh, different values of time, the particle would be at different places. And so its coordinates in principle are different. Okay. So uh, once you know that uh, this position vector as a function of time as essentially, so this is like, uh, you can think of this as being the position vector The other two things that you would try tend to compute once you know this is just the velocity and the acceleration. So then the velocity vector just is what you get by after differentiating the position vector with respect to time, uh, which uh, in practice, I just like, oh, I'm about to do an example. Uh, that just means literally just differentiate each entry with respect to t. Okay. Uh, pictorially, the velocity vector is like a tangent vector to the curve. So, like if you think of the of the particle moving along this roller coaster, then it is like the vectors that I'm drawing here. It is something that's. Um, gives you like a tangent arrow. Yes, so it looks like that. It can, as you can see it, I mean, sometimes it will, it can change in size. It's like, it doesn't like, maybe this is a little bit misleading. Like the vectors, these vectors can have different sizes. As, I mean, clearly they're pointing in different directions, right? But they also can have like different magnitudes as well. Okay. In fact, um, the magnitude of the velocity vector, it's, it's what's known as the speed. So, um, let me write that out because I don't think I, I told you this, but speed equals a magnitude of the velocity vector. And again, I'll, I'll do an example in a second. But uh, so basically, what I'm like the the difference between speed and velocity, uh, which sometimes I guess people can use as synonyms, like in day to day language. Um, but the idea is that you should think of a, a as a velocity when you talk about velocity, you you are really referring to a vector. So it has like, it will be something that has like, for example, three entries. On the other hand, speed being the norm of the velocity or the magnitude of, of the velocity is a number, right? It is always, a, in fact, it's a non-negative number, right? Because like the size is always positive or in the worst case zero. So this is always a non-negative number. Or if, again, if you prefer, uh, you can call this a scalar. So it's a, uh, a non-negative scalar, so. Is that okay so far, Sigrid? So, I mean, I guess cars have this thing called speedome speedometers speedometer because like the thing that you know on your when you're driving that you see like the speedometer is correct you're good <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, those numbers right like that says 100 miles per hour, per hour 60 miles per hour that is like yeah that is a number right so that's like telling you the speed 
of the car. It never, like, it doesn't come with an arrow that's also changing, right? It, otherwise, it would be called velocimeter or uh, whatever. So, um, and finally, the last thing that you may, like, need to compute about a curve is the acceleration vector. Although, actually, uh, does the comp compass count? Uh, Oh, like I think I you know what are you referring to? Like something that you, it, yeah, okay, <laughs> good. But uh, that one, like if that has a direction, it would be like, yeah, if you have something like that, it would be like more of like a velocity type thing. But if it's just like a number, like the miles per hour thing, then it, it is about. Interesting, like when you're driving, they have limits on the road for your speed. But you would also like to give limits on your direction, right? Because you don't want to get, tell a car that they should move in a direction that would make make it crash with other cars. So it's sort of weird that like only speed is written as a limit. On no, interesting point. Yeah, don't move to the right. side of the lane more than Imagine five miles an hour. <laughs> being telling drive along the road, right? Like you don't want if you already if you strictly speaking, if you don't forbid tilting your direction, then you just collide. So, and then the acceleration is just the derivative of the velocity vector. So like essentially the way in which you find it is by having differentiated twice the position vector. Okay, so let's do... Just a quick question about the, uh, the graph, if you could scroll up just a little bit. Yes. Um, here, you mean? Yeah. Uh, so that green vector? Uh, uh, correct, the position vector. Yes. Yep. So because it's starting from the origin and just, and the head of the vector follows this curve, does that mean that we would be measuring it in some sort of circular coordinate system? I mean, you can, I mean, um, uh in general the way in which you think of the position vector is as being like the coordinate in the x direction plus the coordinate in the y direction plus a coordinate in the z direction so it is it can still be written in terms of the vectors i j and k uh mm -hmm. it is also true that there are other things like called spherical coordinates you know uh where like in can also make more sense, like, you know, you can rewrite the position vector in terms of other coordinate systems. Uh, and, and so uh, there, there's one which is called spherical coordinates where it, it would just sort of look a little bit, um, it, which for many purposes is better suited because in spherical coordinates, there's sort of like a vector that's precisely the position vector. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but, yeah. but, in principle, like you should think of it as being written in terms of the sum of the x, y, and z. Yes, in terms of i, j, and k. Yes, okay. but like there are other, right? There are other um, coordinate systems. It's just that we don't really use them in this class for those purposes. We'll use them later when we do integrals. So when we do integrals, like you probably already saw polar coordinates in calc two or whatever. And then there's also like cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates or other things, but those are done more like for doing integrals, not for like rewriting the position vector, which you can still do. It's just something like we don't really do here. Um, Got it, thank you. Sure. So let's like, let's do an example about this, all this stuff. So let's say that you're given a curve, uh, which is going to be this one, t squared sine of t e to the t. Okay. And so, uh, so let's try to find, um, the velocity and acceleration. 
of the curve. I mean, when I say the curve, I just mean of the particle that's moving along the curve, like. And uh, the tangent line. So let's do that. And also let's find the tangent line to this curve at the point um, Okay. So for the first one, there's not that much to do. The velocity is just the derivative of the position. So you have to take the derivative of each entry that gives you two T, right? cosine of t and the last one is e to the t, right? And then um, and then the acceleration is just a derivative of the velocity vector. So it's just um, two negative sine of t e to the t. So far so good, is this okay with everyone? What's more interesting is uh, maybe the second part, which is finding the equation of the tangent line. So let's think a little um, bit. Closer? Yes. One second. I thought it would have been ET times T. Well, it is like, um, you mean for the last one? Yeah. Um, rem like, um, let me put it here, like, Remember that the derivative of um, an exponential is just itself. If you had something like e to the x squared, right, or something like that, then it would be e to the x squared times 2x, right, because you have to multiply by the derivative of the exponent, right? Oh, and the... It's just that the derivative of t with respect to t is 1, so... Okay, 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 okay. Is, is Thank you. Sense? Yeah. 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 Anyone else? So, right. So, so we don't know how the curve looks like. In fact, I'll show you a little, a, a bit of the curve uh, later on GeoGebra once we finish this example. But uh, I'm just saying, okay, on this curve, there's like a point on this curve that is this point uh, pi squared zero comma e to the pi. And so since this point belongs to the curve, there's an equation for the tangent line, uh, which is this line that you see here. And that's the line that we want to find, okay? So the first thing that you have to, and let me copy the equation of the curve here again, so that uh, it's easier to refer to it. So this was the formula for the equation of the curve. It was t squared sine of t e to the t. Uh, so the first thing that you have to figure out for this type of problem is at what time, right, for which value of t, are you located at this point uh, that they gave you? So here's a point P, right? And at, at the, uh, for a particular value of T, that sort of the curve passes through that point. So what's the, the value in this case? Uh, yeah, because what you want is t squared sine of t 
e to the t to be equal to pi squared zero e to the pi. And just by comparison, this is like a comparison between uh, the in, the entries one by one. So the first one has to agree with the first one. The one in the middle has to agree with the middle one. And the last one on, the, on one side agrees with the last one on the other side. So all the equations have to be consistent with one another. And that uh, easily forces t to be pi, if you think about it. So this forces t to be pi. Okay. So at time pi, if you want to say it that way, at time pi, the curve went through that point. Or if it's like the car, the car was located at that point. Is that making sense? Yes. Now, why am I doing this? Because we need the velocity, like, you know, we need a, a vector for the, 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 we need a vector for this green line, right? But I already told you that the, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember, like uh, a line needs a point and a direction, right? We already have a point because it's the point P, right? Like the point P belongs to the tangent line, but we needed a, a direction. And so the direction should of this line should just be the velocity vector of the curve at that point. Is that making sense? So what I'm saying is that there's like a direction vector here. And almost by definition, that's, this direction is precisely given by the velocity vector. Uh, but you just like, is, is that making sense? But it just has to be at the value uh, equal of, right, you have to sub plug in uh, pi into the formula for t. So, so this was a velocity vector at any time, right? But we need to know the velocity vector at the time that it goes through p, right? But we need this at the time we go through p. So that means that we have to plot, evaluate this at time pi. And so this gives you what? 2 pi, uh, cosine of pi is negative 1, and the other one is e to the pi. And so this is a, a direction of the tangent line. So this vector is the direction of the tangent line. Is that making sense? And once you know, so we know a point, right? So we know the point, we have the direction. And so the equation of the line, uh, again, the equation of a line uh, was a point plus, uh, well, they're like, let me write it like this. Um, the equation of the line is like the point plus t times the direction. Uh, the only issue in quotes is that t is already being used uh, in another context. So you may use a different letter. This is similar to when we were intersecting lines that we change one of the names for the variable. So um, what does uh, in the alphabet, what comes after t? Uh, U, is it? U or what is after T? O. O? Oh, no. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, that's such a ugly letter because it looks like zero. And then let's say you. I mean, whatever. Let's say you. Like. And like, again, this is, a, this is something you can also write. This is like the first, like the way I'm, I'm writing it this, uh, here is like the vector form, the parametric form is, um, is just like what you get by uh, equating each of the corresponding entries. So two pi u and then y equals uh, zero plus uh, or minus u. Well, and then uh, obviously you don't have to write the zero. Uh, but it's just to give you like, uh, 
or e to the pi e to anywhere. Is that okay with everyone? Uh, yeah, in this problem, you were given the position vector. Uh, sometimes, like, you may need to find it, like, in the example that we did uh, last time. I don't know if you remember when we found the position vector for the parabola and the intersection of the plane with the ellipsoid. So, but uh, it's either that, I mean, if it's, if you, if you need to find that it's sort of, it's found uh, similar to the examples that we did before, like you're, you're sort of given equations, you just have to combine them. Or if just given, um, um, you just are given like the formula. In this case, it was pi because we needed to know at what time you pass through this point. So you have to set up the expression for the position with a given point. And so uh, after that, you just like compare the entries basically. Is this okay? Any other questions? So originally when we were given the uh, the point before, did, did you basically look at the point and deduce the position equation oh. from it? Uh, no, oh, oh, like, I, I mean, I just, I just had randomly, uh, I mean, I, I came up with the, the formula for the position vector first, like in my head. I, and then I just like, okay, <laughs> I chose my favorite time and then like told you, oh, let's okay. uh, reverse the process in a, in a way. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's basically, uh, yeah, it, it, the equation of the line is like the point. I would not write point uh, position plus u velocity. I would write point plus u velocity. It's a little, uh, I mean, uh, you know, just to say given, right? But it is like it is position at time pi plus velocity u times velocity at time pi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that what you're saying is correct. Yeah, that's like essentially the equation of the tangent line. Yes. Like the only important thing was to realize that you had to um, evaluate things at a particular time, right? At the time that you are located at the point that you care about, if that makes sense. Is that okay? So, um, just to show you this, um, algebra. Uh, can everyone see algebra? Algebra. So again, like here you can enter the equation of a curve. Uh, the first expression, like this expression, expression, expression means like entry, enter the formulas for, for the position vector. So those were um, T squared sine of T, e to the T. And then they ask you to enter the name of the parameter that you're using. So I'm using T as a parameter, right? And then they want you to enter a couple of val uh, I mean, they have to plot it for cer certain values of T. So let's try, like, um, let's say, let's say we want to go from negative four, time negative four to time four. So that we include pi, okay? Do you see it? And so that's how the piece of the curve looks like uh, between time uh, negative four seconds and four seconds, okay? So that's sort of like, let's make it, make it color. Can everyone see it? Okay, so that's sort of like the curve. Uh, 
And then, um, and so for example, the point P was like the position vector at time pi. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, the name of the curve is A. <laughs> Let me see if I can change the name of the curve. Oh, <laughs> there you are. Everyone sees that point P now. We had to do a zoom out. So that's the point P. So that's a time, um, again, uh, that's, I mean, you won't get it based on the graphs. You have to look more carefully at the equation just because, you know, uh, it, it won't, I mean, I'll, I'll, I, it, it's because uh, T is not like a variable that's being drawn on X, Y, Z, right? T is sort of like the variable your watch gives you. So it's like, it's not drawn explicitly, if that makes sense. It, right, it's like an input space, but I'm just saying that it's sort of hidden because, you know, time is not visual in the same way in which X, Y, and Z are visual. Even if, you know, so, because here I'm never drawing like an axis for T. So it says that that's why you cannot just read T from the, from the picture. You have to look at the equations. And then, um, and then the, the equation of the tangent line was another, I mean, if, if you wanted to tr um, also draw the tangent line here, you would use it in the parametric equation. So it was pi times pi plus, two times pi times u, right? If you compare it with what we wrote, then it was negative u, and then it would be, the other one was e to the pi. Uh, plus e to the pi times u, or u times e to the pi. And so here the parameter value variable is called u, and again, like you can give a couple of values. Like I think if I make it go from negative two to two, it would be fine. Okay, yeah, I don't know if, it, <laughs> there it is, but it's a little bit difficult to see. Uh, let me remove some of, everyone sees like a green thing? No. Uh, like, do you see? Uh, it looks almost black. But Let yeah, me, now you can see it. Uh, yeah, I made it a little bit bigger. Uh, so you see like it, barely, it touches the pink curve, right? Uh, it's just a problem of scale. You have to zoom in a little bit better so that this um, the picture is like more, for, yeah, yeah. Now uh, it's, I think you can tell them apart, uh, but yeah. That's like the tangent line. Uh, you can put T on a slider, right. Uh, I didn't do it this way here, but yeah, you can, there's also a slider option. And so you can, then you can change the T on the animation and see where, how the curve is changing, yes. Uh, it's just that I would need to restart it. But I mean, this gives you like, like it shows you that everything was fine that we, what we were doing. I have a quick question. Uh... And you can also, sorry, just to answer this, you can also show the tangent as a vector, but that requires a little uh, more commands on algebra, but it can be done. It just a little bit less, it's more tricky here, but you can go, uh, you know, sorry, just to, 
and then I'll answer. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm just sharing not, not this one. I'm sure I'm trying to share the Firefox. So if you go to uh, if you if you go to the GeoGebra page uh, and like for example type for net frame, then you can write here like the equations. Uh, of the curve, uh, and again, for some stupid reason, now you you cannot use uh, t here. You have to use it in terms of x, but it's the same equation that um, that it, it it looks something like that, and then the the. And then you 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 sort of see the tangent vector, which is sort of this pink ve vector that shows up here. Um, so there's a way to do it on. Uh, I, I don't know if everyone's yeah. Sorry, now What's someone was circle talking about that follows the point. Oh, this circle. Yeah. Well, so if we were to finish this exam, um, this chapter completely, which we're not, the idea is that you know. Um, you have the vectors i, j, and k that yeah. we saw, but those are sort of fixed in space, okay? Mm -hmm. But you can sort of create like actually this actually uh, this is used like in video games and things like that for computer graphics. You can sort of create like a version of i, j, and k that move with the curve, and so they're like okay. moving version like moving i, j, k's. I mean they're not called moving i, j, k's. They're just called tangent, <laughs> normal, and binormal vector, which are these things that you see here, like tangent. Yep normal and the binormal is on the other side and so there's like a plane there's a plane that contain that's created by two of the three vectors and mm -hmm. there's like a circle whose radius is the inverse like you know you can talk about how curved a curve is like the what's called the curvature of the curve mm -hmm. and the circle has radius equals to the reciprocal of the curvature so that's called the oscillating circle that's like I mean that's it, it is sort of useful if you want to study curves, but it's not something that we're going to talk about. That's but, actually a great segue into the question I was going to ask earlier. Yeah. This is just really quickly. So right now we're working with a curve. Uh, is that kind of a preparation for when this curve becomes a plane that is just weirdly shaped? So you have a ribbon that's like in three D space, and we have to find an area of it. Well, yes and no, it's sort of preparation, but uh, until a little bit later in the class, like we won't use this uh, right away, but later we will, yes, as you're saying, um, you know, a curve, it sort of depends on one variable, which we're calling T. When you have like a surface that will depend on two variables uh, because then you can move in a sense in another direction. Yeah. And we will talk about parametrizing surfaces like towards the end of the class. Mm -hmm. And you can use that to find areas and other things, yes. Yeah. But yeah, I sort of mm, this is put on hold after this week. We uh, which switch a little bit of topics uh, next time. But I mean, uh, after next week, we switch a bit of topics, and then we will return to this stuff about curve later in the course. And once we return to it, we'll talk about our surfaces and other things. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Okay, and then. Um, Let me just go back to, to the iPad stuff. And uh, right. Um, so the last the last really important thing about this chapter that you need to know is uh, this thing about arc length. So let me um, go first to talk about arc length and length of a curve. And then I'll just mention something else uh, uh, towards the end, but this is more important to discuss right now. So length of a curve and arc length. So um, uh, 
So again, imagine that there's like this curve in space. Uh, you can do it a little bit more interesting, a, a, a cuter curve. So you can do something like this. Okay. So that's your curve in space. Again, that's um, given by some position vector. And if you think of this curve again as a road or some sort of wire, right? Maybe you're located here at time A, right? So maybe, maybe this is where you are at time A. So let's put it like this. And maybe at time a, a bit later, you are here, right? So this is like, your position at time A, and this is your position at time B. Right? And so from for going between this point and this point, you know, you're going to spend some sort of fuel or you're going to drive for some amount of time. You're going to travel some distance, right? The distance that you travel is precisely the length of that piece of the curve. Is that making sense? Which is what I'm putting like uh, with green. Uh, so the distance traveled from time A to B is the length of the curve. Between those two points, right? Is that making sense with everyone? Is that, is that okay? Uh, but then, you know, uh, what is distance? Uh, like the idea is sort of like this, like speed is like distance over time. And so distance is sort of speed times time. So distance is like, it's like speed times time. And essentially this formula is basically correct if you use like an integral because the speed can be a function of time. So like, um, so the formula for this, the length, like the distance travel or the length. So this is the formula that you need to know. So the length or distance between from time A to time B is um, Now let's put it. So. In this case, we're going to need to find the vector version of the velocity that is parameterized to have t as the variable? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'm about to do it uh, with the case of the circle. Uh, but yeah, you first find the, you have to find the position as a function of time, then you find the velocity, 
and then you find the speed and, and that's what you integrate. Uh, is this okay? Um, but it's like an ordinary integral of, of one variable. That's what I'm, um, like you'll see that that's what ends up happening. So, Oh, in fact, like let's do let's do a, a different um, of curves. Let me show you this one on GeoGebra. Uh, can everyone see it? Uh, so instead of t squared sine of t e to the t, I'm going to use cosine of t, sine of t and t, and then I'll let this go from zero to two pi. Can everyone see the the curve? It's like it's what's called uh, a helix. So let me uh, draw it on the iPad. Um, so let's do this example, which is a helix. So for the helix, uh, it, it has equation cosine of t, sine of t comma t. And it looks like a spiral staircase basically. Okay. And so let's try to find the length of the helix from time zero to time two pi, say. So here again, you start like the like the idea is that you start with the formula for for the position vector, and then you find the velocity vector. And then you find the speed, which is the norm of the velocity vector. So there's this identity that sine squared plus cosine squared is one, which uh, is very useful for this type of problems. So this just gives you um, root of two. Is that making sense? So that's the speed. And so the length of the helix would have been the integral from zero to two pi 
what do you integrate? You integrate the speed. And so you're doing the integral from zero to two pi of, of square root of two times dt. And so that gives you uh, two pi square root of two or two square root of two pi. Is that okay? Yeah. So uh, there's a slight variation of this, this idea, okay? Is it possible to find volume using this method? Uh, well, uh, no. Or maybe the surface area of something. Well, uh, it, it, it does have it's a similar good. flavor, but it is not quite the, the same. Yeah. yeah, it just, um, we like all what we'll do later at the end of the course is sort of you, you sort of approximate a surface area by, by a bunch of parallelograms. And then you can find, like, if you remember, the area of a parallelogram is, involves the cross product of two vectors. Yeah. And, yeah. and so the, this cross product, the vectors that you plug in into the cross product are sort of like velocity vectors of two different trajectories that you draw on the surface. So you imagine like a surface as a system of two, two systems of roads, right? Like some sort of like version of east, west, north, south roads. Yep. So they're like uh, different cars traveling on a surface and each of these cars has its own velocity vector. And from those two, you can sort of build like a parallelogram. And, oh. and then that's what you integrate. Uh, that uh, has to do with something that's called the Jacobian. Uh, but it's a little bit more, complicated than this. Is it, so far so good, are there any questions about the length? And all the questions that ask about finding the length of a curve are essentially like this. Uh, you find the velocity, after you find the velocity, you find the speed, and that's what you end up integrating. So there's a slightly a slight variation which is called the arc length, okay? The arc length function, uh, which I'll call S of T. And the arc length function, what that does for you is that again, um, You have the, now for this uh, uh, here, you, you just imagine that you want to measure the distance from time zero. So at time zero, you imagine that you're here. So this is where you are at time zero. And then you want to measure the distance traveled to some other point on the curve. So to some other point here on the curve which is a time t. And so the arc length, the arc length by definition is uh, the length of the curve from time zero to time t. So what I'm saying is that here, there's some length between these two points and this is s of t. So s of t is the distance or length of the curve from time zero to time t. So like what we're doing different from the previous perspective is that now you think that the end time uh, is some variable. I mean, it's some number, but which in a sense you don't know per se. So it's, you think of it as a variable. Uh, so you always like start at time zero just to make it, uh, just to agree on some convention. And then you want to know how much distance you travel from zero to time t. But t now can be one hour or two hours or four hours. So you think of it as playing like the role of some sort of variable. 
Okay. Quick question: Is it possible that uh, you know the say we can we estimate something if say t goes to infinity, like uh, something that we did with? Oh, uh, right, right, right. Uh, you could like yeah, that would be sort of like the entire length of the curve. Uh, yeah. In most cases, that length will be in infinite, meaning that the curve has infinite length. But sometimes the curve can be finite in length. Uh, uh, yeah. Although we are not going to do improper integrals because that strictly speaking would be like some sort of improper integral right because you let the upper bound go to infinity uh is, is that making sense yeah but yeah like um that's like right if you wanted to go from like negative infinity to infinity that would be like sort of like the entire length of the curve um it should i scroll up more or is that what you need so I'm just saying, like it's the same fun. It's the same formula that I just wrote you for length, but now we are fixing the lower bound to be zero, and we're fixing the upper bound to be t. So uh, so it's the same formula as before. It's just that now the upper bound is like a variable. So now the upper bound. Sorry. Now, the upper bound is a variable. And uh, t. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a variable t. It's, it's a variable t. So again, let me do an example. I like these things like just become a little bit more clear if you if you, if you think about something concrete. So let's do an, an example for this case. So I, I, and I'll tell you why we do this in a second. Oh oh, not I mean just because I had to give you some upper bound uh you could have like the bound could have been pi in which case you do the integral up to pi it's just like i needed like in a sense like since cosine and sine have period to pi it sort of makes sense to to put the integral there so that you see like how much the length was after a full revolution but yeah it could have been another number it could have been pi or something else So in general, like if you're asked for length, you'll be given some bounds. So So yeah, it, let's try to do this. It's the same as before. Uh, you find, find first a velocity vector, which is zero e to the t, three e to the t. And then you find the speed, right? So that's the square root of zero squared plus e to the two t plus nine e to the two t, right? And that, that gives you the square root so the speed is just 10 e to the 2t, which is square root of 10 times e to the t. Is that making sense? So far, so good. That's the speed as a function of time. And so, um, the length is just the integral, the arc length is just the integral of this function from zero to t. 
So S of T is still the integral. Is that okay? So this this is telling you how much. So again, this function tells you the distance traveled at until time t. So this is again the distance or the length of the curve or length of length of the curve between time zero and time t. Uh, so far so good. And um, so the thing is like, the point is that, uh, so here you see like, uh, you can think of S as a function, like the idea is to think of this as S as a function of T, but um, when you do an arc, so this is what people call an arc length parametrization. Let me explain that. What you do uh, of the curve, when you what you do here is that you reverse the roles, and so you think of t as being specified by s. So here, um, you reverse the roles and think of t as a function of s. So again, uh, if you look at this equation, this equation is saying that S equals root of 10 times E to the T minus one, right? And so how would you solve this equation for T? Well, you divide by root of 10 on both sides. And then you add one. And then how do you solve here for T? You, you take LN, right? Is this okay? So this gives you T as a function of, of S. Uh, the way you, you should think of this, um, the way you should think about this formula is that it's saying like, if you know how much distance you travel, you have traveled, you also know how much, you know at what time, like if I told you, imagine you traveled 10 miles, this uh, by knowing that you traveled, have traveled 10 miles, you know at uh, what time this happened you know at what time you have traveled 10 miles. So like the time traveled is also specified by, by the distance you have, like um, you have moved. Is that okay? Uh, so it's like saying, if you know how much amount of fuel you have used, you sort of have like, uh, you can, uh, you can sort of use that information to say for how for what amount of time you have uh been on the road if you think that fuel and distance are sort of correlated which they are in principle is this okay so far so good and so the 
the, 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 the idea of the arc length parametrization is that you rewrite the curve in, in terms of writing the curve as a function of t, you just write the curve as a function of s. So in an arc length parametrization, so you use this, so you use this to, to rewrite r of t as, a, as r of s. So you specify the position vector by s. So like in our example, r of t was one comma e to the t, e three e to the t. And so since t is this expression of s, r of s becomes one comma e to the t, but t is ln of root of, sorry, of s divided by root of 10 plus one, and then t e to the t, which is ln of s divided by root of 10 plus one. Is this okay? So, um, so again, like the steps that you have to do to find the arc length parametrization. Uh, you find S of T and then you, um, you write T as a function of S so find S of T and then use that equation, use that formula. To write T in terms of S. And finally, uh, substitute T In, the, in your expression for R of S, R of T. Is this okay? So let's do it for the helix case. Uh, so this is clear. So, So for the case of the helix, the equation of the helix was cosine of t, sine of t, comma t. I had already told you that the velocity was negative sine of t, cosine of t, comma one. And we had said that the speed was square root of two, if you remember the previous example. Yeah, that, 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 the, and the final step gives you uh, um, R of S. And so if you look at the formula for S of T, S of T by definition was the integral from zero to T of the, of the speed, you integrate the speed. And so S of T is um, the integral from zero to T of root of two times dt. And that's not a, a bad, a, such a difficult formula. It's, root, it's just root of two times T, right? And like that, that, that's saying that S equals root of two times T. And so T equals, S over root of two. Is that making sense? So I revert it, I reverse the roles. Uh, and then you just plug that in back into the formula for R for the position vector. So the position vector now as a function of S is cosine of S over root of two, sine of S over root of two, comma S over root of two. Is that okay?
So uh, on an exam, are we going to be asked, what will we be asked or will- uh, It would be as like, find the arc length parameterization. Okay, it'll be listed yeah. as, as the name. <laughs> right, it would be explicitly as the name, yes. Professor, is that an S or a five? Uh, this should always be an S. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. There should be no five here. That's yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no worries. Yeah, the, those can tend to uh, get. And also, this is a two, not like a Z. Uh, you know, it, there's a yeah. The context hopefully will finish making the decision of what they mean. But yeah, yeah. It, it should always be the letter S. Uh, this is like, this is 13.3, uh, this stuff about arc length. Um, sorry, I should put it, let me go back a little bit, arc length. This is 13.3. Uh, I think the assignments, the 13.3 assignments should have some good examples. If you look at old exam pro of the, at the old exam assignments, there are also arc length problems there. Uh, that's a typical, like, you know, arc length is something that appears like many in many of the old exams. So if you go to the old exams, you can also find, find that. Is that making sense? Um, uh, and then the last two things that I should tell you, uh, this, we're almost done. The last two things I should mention, um, again, from section 13.1, is that there's a vector that's called the tangent vector, which we really don't use because, again, we're cutting a lot of, uh, we're deleting so many chapters, uh, sections of, the, of this chapter. But there's a thing called the tangent vector, which is just a velocity vector divided by its norm. So if you are asked to find the tangent vector, It's just a velocity vector of a curve divided by the norm of the curve. So in our example from before, uh, for um, so in the example of uh, one e to the t, three e to the t, the velocity vector was uh, zero e to the t, three e to the t. And the speed we have found to be um, root of 10 e to the t. And so the tangent vector is just um, velocity divided by its speed. And so that gives you um, So the tangent vector in this case is just zero, one over root of t, uh, three over root of t. Is that making sense? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. it is okay. Sometimes it, it will depend on T, other times it does not, so that, that's okay. Like in general, it can be a function of T. But like in practice, it's just take, find a velocity vector and divide by its speed. So that's one thing, there's not too much. Again, there are more interesting things when, could say about this if we were like, you know, finishing chapter 13, it's just that we're not really doing too much with it. Uh, again, uh, the idea is that the tangent vector is sort of like, a, it's just like a unit vector in the direction of the velocity, essentially. So it's just like a rescaled version of the velocity, uh, basically.
And then the last thing, um, which th there's like, you know, in section 13 to, uh, there's a stuff about projectile motion, which you really don't need to know. So like you can read that part. Uh, the only thing you need to know about section two is that uh, you can find the position vector by integrating the velocity vector. That's the only thing we, we will do. Uh, you can, so, so if you're given the velocity vector, you can find uh, R of T by integrating V of T. With respect to t. That's all that you need to know uh, of that section. So uh, again, um, so for example, um, that's the only like to the all, all extent that we will use that section. So say if the let's say they tell you t. <laughs> Let's do something quick. Um, so let's say they give you the velocity vector to be this one. Uh, and they need to give you also something that's called an, in an initial condition. The reason we're not going to spend too much time doing this is because there's a class called differential equations where you do more of this type of stuff. So. So this is why uh, it's not really that much part of the of this class. Uh, but the idea is like to find the position vector, you just integrate each entry of the velocity vector. So what's the integral of t? That's t squared over two, right? What's the integral of e to the t? That's e to the t. And what's the integral of t squared? That's um, T cubed over three. Is that making sense so far so good? Um, no, well, how, yes. How is two, how is there two there? Uh, oh, uh, two here downstairs. Oh, or this two. Yeah. That one. This one? Mm -hmm. I'll explain it. Like the thing is that strictly speaking, I still not done because I have to add plus constants of integration, right? When you okay. integrate, when you integrate, there's strictly speaking constants of integration. Uh, the gist here is that there's a constant for each integral, right? So you end up with three constants of integration. And then to, to pin down the values of the constants, you have to use the information at time zero. So that's where you have to use the fact that, um, Sorry, the, the, uh, I meant the position vector here. Um, you have to use the fact that the position at time zero was uh, a particular vector that you were given. So that's, you have to plug in t equals zero in this formula. And so if you plug in t equals zero, you, by comparison, you get c1 comma one plus c2 and then C3, but that should be the same as uh, 0, 1, 2. And so you see that forces, uh, and I'm ab about to finish, sorry. And that forces C1 to be 0, C2 to be 0, and C3 to be 2. Now, why that vector is just because I had to choose a random vector. Like in general, one always chooses like some whatever, like in practice, this is always given to you. So it's just whatever vector you were given. And so, but with that information, I'm just saying that the position vector becomes um, t squared over two, e to the t, and then t cubed over three plus two. And that's the solution. Okay, so in a, like, it's just that when you, like basically what you need to remember is that when, I, there's a YouTube video where I do another example, so I'll send you that link. Uh, but ba basically whenever you integrate, you just add a constant of integration. And then the, const the values for the constants of integration are found by just plugging in 
the 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 val like comparing with the values that they gave they give you a time zero, and so that's how that's how you finish the problem. So I mean, this we're not spending too much time in this section because there's really not done much. Besides doing these integrals, there's nothing else in, in that you need to know from that section. So really, the important part is to understand this stuff about arc length. That's more important than, than section thirteen too. But that's just like essentially how these type of problems are done. You just integrate it. Um, so on Monday again, I'll give you more office hours so i'll send you a link but like this is uh, now we did finish everything for the exam so uh this is uh, in section 13 2. but i'm saying that 13 2 has a little bit more stuff like this projectile motion which you really don't we don't use for this class so um the only thing that you need to know of, of section 13 2 is that you have you can find the position vector by integrating the velocity vector. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I can answer some questions, if, but yeah, uh, you can also leave if you want. So I'll see you on Monday. Um, but we'll start new stuff on Monday. Just in case. Thank you, Professor. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Uh, yeah, so I think someone wanted to ask me about a homework problem. I can answer that one. Yeah, so I had a question about number 15 on 12.5. Um, actually, my roommate is also in multivariable, and she went to office hours with her professor and asked him, and we were both super confused about it. Um, so he, like, gave her, let me see, I think I have the email that he sent her of, like, how to do it. And I just kind of did not understand anything. Uh, let's, let me, 12.5, you said, right? Yeah, number 15. <laughs> I feel someone had asked me that one before, let's see. Oh, yeah, 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 I remember, um, yes. This is the one you're talking about, right? Yeah. Now, uh, I should say that here, I'm pretty sure the formula for the distance between lines is not explicitly on the book, right? Yeah, it's not, because when I went to go open the textbook, right. so it didn't have it. At least that, based on that, that would not be asked on the exam, because we can, we won't ask any form, about any formulas that are not on the book. Uh, but I can still explain it to you. I mean, I just should not have included this on the assignment. Like, it's just, um, right, because... Uh, so you, you're. I know that they're parallel, but I can't like figure out how to find the distance between the two. So like her professor had said to find a point on L one and L two. Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll let me do it on the iPad, but I'll put like a a, a series saying not on the exam because uh, distance between lines is not uh, it's not a formula on the. On the book so um let me do but it, if you do a picture it will become clear so i let me can you see the ipad again yeah so again this one is not on on the on the exam it's this formula so if you have two parallel lines right what you do is basically you choose a point on one line, you choose another point on the other line, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's a, a vector connecting the two points, PQ. Mm -hmm. And you see, there's like, if you think of this as a direction of one of the lines, the direction vector of one of the lines, there's this shadow that we talked about before. Which the projection? Is, yes, the projection of it's an application of the projection formula. That's why I included it on the assignment. Uh, so that's a projection of the, you know, uh, PQ along V, right? Mm -hmm. 
But you see, like that's not really the 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 vector that you're after. The vector that you're after is sort of like the complement to that, like the one that's orthogonal. Yeah. Pick one, and that's all by definition like PQ minus a projection. Okay. And so uh, the distance is just the size of that vector. So the distance is the size of PQ. Is, is that making sense? Yeah. And there you go. Okay. Yes. Uh, there, 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 there's this, is that, is that okay? Like that, that formula? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this other formula, which is even worse, which is like, what's the distance between lines when they're not parallel, right? Mm -hmm. That's also asked on this problem. Um, the skew lines? The skew lines, yeah. Like that even is a little bit worse. I mean, that takes more time to explain. So I can just like, um, let's see, I, I have it here. Because that one is a little bit more tricky. Let me see if I find it. Yeah, that one, I mean, this, like, you you can take it as a black box just to finish that problem. Uh, but again, like, that's not, this one definitely would not be someone, one that you would ever get asked on the exam because this one is too complicated. But if you have two skew lines, like, it, you have to draw, like, a parallel pipet and other things. That's, that's why it makes this form, it, it is a tricky formula. Like one line has a vector, direction vector u, the other has a direction vector v, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you can still do this thing about finding a point p and a point q on each line. And then the distance, again, um, let, let me put it here, not on the exam. It is just, um, yeah, it is, here it is, it's pq dot u cross v divided by u cross v. So like the idea is uh, the numerator is sort of like the volume of a parallel, of some parallel pipet. And then mm -hmm. you divide by the denominator is like an area. And so volume by area has like is some sort of length and that length actually corresponds to the distance between the lines. It's just that that's difficult to see because you have to draw like a parallel people and a bunch of other stuff. So that one is that one is not that easy to figure out from the picture. But again, like you can just use these two formulas if you want uh, for this assignment. But, okay. but since it's not explicitly written as formulas on the book, in those okay. sections, like it won't, there won't be a question about those things. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah, that makes it a lot clearer. Thank you. Perfect. perfect. Good. See. You.